I'm sure by this point many of you know what analog horror is, given how popular it's been on the internet the past couple of years. But for those of you who don't know, analog horror is basically internet horror based around found footage and vintage style recordings or broadcasts that include cryptic messages or all around scary imagery to scare you. I'm sure many of you have heard of popular titles like the Mandela Catalog, the Local 58, and the Walton Files. But one that I see almost no discussion on is Vita Carnis, or Living Meat in Latin. The series was created by Darian Quilloy and the first part was uploaded on April 23rd, 2022. The first part of the series is referred to as the Living Meat documentary, which is footage created by the National Living Meat Research Organization, which basically discusses new life forms that suddenly began to populate the earth around 1931, as the video claims. The most viewed video on the series is the compilation of the documentaries, which, as of making this video, is sitting around 500k views, which, yeah, is a lot, but relative to the other ones I've mentioned, it's kind of gone under the radar. I myself hadn't even known about it until this viewer had recommended it to me, so shout out. In this video, I'm going to be explaining each video that's currently out in the series, then try to make sense of it all and piece together what it all means. So, if you haven't seen the original videos, I highly recommend you check them out and then come back here. I'll leave a link in the description for those. I am by no means the best at theory crafting, but I'll do my best to give a well supported theory. So, without further ado, my name's Nas, and let's explore. We start the series off with an informational video described as the Living Meat documentary. It explains to us that very recently new life forms have emerged seemingly out of nowhere, but explicitly tells us that these are not aliens or demons because their biological origin matches organic material found on Earth. They've been named Vita Carnis due to their physical appearances, and the information we know about them is that they're primarily made of flesh, organs, and bones. Their diet consists of only organic material with most of them only eating meat. It also tells us that they greatly resemble animals with no skin or store-bought meat. Which, I mean, that doesn't take a lot of scientists to figure out. I mean, just look at these things real quick. They look like meat from Mortal Kombat's whole extended family. We are then introduced to our first species that has been named Crawl. Crawl kind of looks like red meaty tree roots and typically grows on other plants or man-made structures. If you've ever seen ivy leaves all over the side of a building, that's kind of what it looks like. The crawl uses its roots to absorb water and other organic material and dirt and other surfaces that it's resting on and converts it into usable energy. Not only that, but the video says its dark roots are ideal for absorbing sunlight and uses a process similar to photosynthesis as a secondary method of obtaining usable energy. The versatility of the crawl enables it to grow in just about every part of the world, which I assume means it's resilient to extreme weather conditions as well. You would think that crawl would take up too many resources from other plants to do its abundance, but no, they actually help boost the ecosystem all around. Apparently the crawl's old branches decay and fall off, then it gets absorbed into the soil and becomes nutrient-rich compost, which is then used by other plants. This allows for other plant life to flourish, then it creates more food for herbivores, which then makes more food for carnivores. Not only that, but humanity uses crawl to their benefit as well, creating crawl farms that will be harvested for their dead vines to make compost. It also mentions that it can be safely consumed and used as a direct food source, but I mean, I wouldn't be too eager to take a bite of this gross ass plant jerky. But that's it for the crawl for the time being. We now move on to the next creature, which is called a trimming, officially labeled Ignavis carnis, or lazy meat. Trimmings are smallish animals that resemble a skin raccoon. These are the documentary's descriptions, not mine. To me, these things look more like giant meaty water bears, but hey, I'm not the expert here. Trimmings each have individual distinct characteristics with differing body shape, number of limbs, and anything else Satan wanted to put on them in the character creator studio. Its life starts as a meat bud on a crawl, which I forgot to mention is going to be the way most of these creatures start their life cycles. But anyway, the meat bud falls off, becoming a trimming. The trimming then goes on its own and looks for food to eat. They're mostly scavengers, primarily eating rotten plants and dead animals. Despite their unholy appearance, this is because they're actually quite weak animals and will run and screech when confronted. They're at the bottom of the food chain, which would make you think that they would die out given their limited options. But remember, they don't reproduce like you and I. They respawn from the crawl at a rapid growth meaning wherever there is an abundance of crawl, 
means there's an abundance of trimmings as well. This makes them seem more as pests than anything, rooting through trash and doing that screeching thing they do at night. They don't do anything that could benefit humanity, so... Besides all of this, some people still keep trimmings as pets and relatively domesticate them. Wait, wait, I don't understand. Bro, why? You mean to tell me people actually want this thing in their house? Now, I know trimmings are harmless, but... I still feel like people would have a hard time treating this animal like they would a cat, but maybe I'm the one who's in the wrong, I don't fucking know. The next species is called a meat snake or muturai carnis. Muturai meaning to borrow. Can you, can you guess what meat snakes are made of? That's right. <laughs> they have a transparent membrane that acts as skin that holds its body together and contains some type of fluid that prevents its flesh and organs from drying out. Meat snake size can vary starting out only a few centimeters when it first leaves its crawl mommy and reaches an average length of five meters those specific factors such as war can make it surpass this length hmm i wonder why war would make the meat snake grow larger oh well i'm sure there's no reason for that its diet consists mostly of dead or dying animals because it's not strong enough to digest a healthy animal similar to normal snakes it uses its tongue as a center to feel out its environment and locate food it catches particles of the dead or dying animal which it uses to track down the animal also like normal snakes it will swallow it whole and begin to digest it at a very slow rate so that the food lasts as long as possible the flesh and bone that it doesn't get digested goes down its stomach and infuses into the meat snake itself so it grows in size. Skull of the animal will be taken and used as a skull for the meat snake, which is probably why its name includes to borrow. Meat snake's lifespan depends on how much food it's able to consume, with the largest on record living 28 years. It naturally has no predators and is immune to diseases due to its preserving chemicals within its stomach, meaning the only way for it to die is from starvation, burning to death, or destroying the membrane holding its body together so it kind of flops out all over the ground. Meat snakes can only live in warmer climates that don't fall too far on one side of hot or cold, and their population size completely relies on what's available for them to eat. Meat snakes are used by multiple different groups of people, but usually always as some sort of meat garbage bin. Next up is the mimic, Trucida Tru Trucidatum or butchered meat. Mimics are humanoid creatures sharing many characteristics to humans, but with some exaggerated features such as long limbs, fingers, and of course, the missing skin. Their teeth are mostly incisors and they look like they're constantly smiling, but this is just because their faces are structured this way so they can open their jaws really wide. The mimic starts their life cycle similar to trimmings, starting out as a meat bud that detaches from the crawl and will begin to hunt smaller animals then move on to bigger animals as they grow in size. Once it gets big enough, it metamorphosizes into the previously described humanoid form. A mature mimic's diet is comprised entirely of human flesh. They will stalk their target and learn their habits and daily routine to find out when they're most vulnerable. This is when they will attack and begin to devour their target. Once it's full, it'll leave and go far away from the scene and begin to digest its meal. When they're digesting their food, they go into this kind of suppressed status where they just stand around and do nothing, even if they see a person. It's as if the target is awake, they'll use sounds to scare their prey into going into another position that will be easier for them to attack in. Although, in the case that a human is awake, a mimic will use a variety of sounds to either lure or startle prey into cornering themselves. Suddenly the video is interrupted with footage of someone who seems to be running away from a mimic. It locked the door, but it doesn't seem to be enough as it pounds and rattles the door and eventually makes its way in. We can hear footsteps as the person hides in the closet, but keeps beaming the flashlight through the cracks. I have no idea why they do this because as you're about to see, this thing got some papers on him. But yeah, it slowly opens the door with its long ass fingers and pokes his head in and... I think it's safe to assume that this person is... Dead as hell! Because we instantly jump right back to the documentary. Mimics will change into one of two forms from this Freddy Krueger looking ass form. The first one is when it eats a fair amount of humans, it starts to develop more human-like features. It grows skin, hair, and other stuff to make something like this, 
look identical to a human so it can blend in and lure other humans in better. If he eats a larger number of humans, it'll evolve into the second type of adult mimic, which is an elder mimic. It grows into a larger and more advanced hunter. Its human-like features completely fade away as its limbs grow even longer and its skin turns this dark shade, which is more durable and flexible now. Its face, however, remains this pink hue and its teeth sink back into its throat. Mimics are obviously a big threat to humanity, so we are given advice on how to protect ourselves against mimics. Such tips include not going out late at night alone, quietly leaving the area if you see a stationary mimic, if you're being chased, get into a position to run away, and if you're cornered, get into the fetal position and make as much noise as you can to alert other people of your position. Additionally, if you have a weapon, it says don't try to attack the mimic because I'm sure this will confuse the mimic long enough for someone to actually be able to save you in time. Next up is the Harvester, or Big Meaty Testicle. The Harvester's base is a large mass with tendrils that branch out from the bottom and root underneath the soil. These tendrils can extend up to 150 meters in diameter. This is because it uses them to hunt. Harvesters are created when a meat bud on a crawl doesn't break off and continues to grow until it grows its own tendrils. They have two different types of tendrils. One that is flat and has these claws that come up from the ground to grab onto prey as well as injecting them with two types of venom. One that causes paralysis and the other prevents blood cells from clotting. This is so that the prey will bleed out. This is when the second set of tendrils deeper in the ground come up, drink the blood, and pull the body underneath the surface for the harvest to digest. The remains underneath the ground leaves behind nutrient-rich soil which increases plant growth which then attracts more animals for the harvester to eat. So if you see an abundance of greenery in a specific area with not a lot of larger animals walking around, you probably want to stay the hell away from that area unless you want to die a very slow and painful death. The harvester only populates woodland areas in the northern hemisphere and are somewhat rare but still very dangerous and are to be avoided by all means because there is no cure for their toxins. The next species is the host of influence, Imperium carnis, or the government meat. The host is a humanoid looking creature with its lower half being burrowed into the ground. It has muscular tissue fiber, tendons, and veins instead of skin on the outside. It has a smooth slender man face and a neck vagina which it uses to eat. It also has these spines on its back that shoot spores produced within the host's body. These spores are how it catches its prey. When inhaled, the spores make their way into the victim's brain and then they become infected. The initial symptoms will leave the individual very exhausted and uncoordinated. Then as time goes on, they will start feeling physical pain including things like migraines and dizziness. After six or seven hours of infection, the individual will immediately stop what they're doing and start walking towards the host that infected them. Once they reach the host, they will kneel in front of them and expose their vital organs. The host will then gut them, eat them, and discard the rest of them. If the host doesn't like its current location or feels that it's not getting enough prey, then it uproots itself and finds a new location. I like to imagine that when it's looking for a new spot, it waddles on its long ass arms because, you know, it's got no legs. If the infected person is kept away from the host for 36 hours, the effects of the host spores will wear off and the individual will go back to normal. Hosts are very rare, but again, are very dangerous with the whole gutting people part. So if you experience these symptoms or see someone else with them, you need to contact the proper authorities and make sure they don't stroll over to the host and get gutted like a fish. The last carnage species that we are shown are the monolith, Olum carnage, or heaven meat. Monoliths are apparently relatively new creatures that appeared in June of 1972, which is roughly 40 years after all this stuff started appearing. Right when it's about to tell us where they're located, the video begins to go static and the audio cuts out. The monolith is a very new creature, only showing up in June of 1972, in the area of but looking on the map, we can see a very small part of Canada glowing red, indicating where they are. There's seven monoliths here, all standing in a circular formation around something unknown to us because the video cuts the information out again. String of monoliths surround. Monoliths are described as titanic sized beings that measure about 120 meters in height with two thick legs that are connected to a torso. The body is made up of thick strands tightly woven together that end at its neck and form its head that has a large hole in the center. The monoliths just stand still and do nothing unless they're approached. Uh, he's just standing there menacingly! Which then they go into attack mode.
They use their long appendages to attack nearby intruders and also have used an EMP-like shockwave to disable nearby vehicles. But yeah, other than that, they really don't do anything. At least for now. The last creature we're shown is called the Singularity, Verum Carnis, or The Truth. This recording seems to be a separate entry in this documentary, almost like it's not even supposed to be here at all. The background music that has been playing throughout the video is now glitching and looping, and there's a faint static overlapping the footage accompanied with white noise. The voice is also different. It sounds more like a person reading this entry to us as opposed to the robotic automated voice that's been narrating the documentary for us. There are a variety of readings that have been observed from the orb including magnetic fields and energy signatures, whatever that's supposed to mean. Before we're told any more information, the video glitches out again and resumes back to the documentary, not addressing the singularity at all despite it seeming like it was setting up for it given that it has the space left open for it. Then the documentary ends. I intentionally waited to mention that throughout each section, there are times where the video will glitch out and flash an image on screen. Some of these images appear to be out of a hand-drawn storybook and tell us an interesting story that I assume is some history into what happened, and others give us information about what's currently happening in the universe. I'm going to explain what they contain, but I'm going to leave the full analysis and discussion on them until the end. The first image we get is a newspaper clipping with the headline, Radio Tower Overgrown with Crawl. Some parts of it are blacked out with a marker and a whole passage seems to be ripped out. The next image is a storybook page that looks to have an illustration of a royal family. Parts of this message are simply too blurry to read, but what I can make out is that it says, Once upon a time, there was a distant kingdom. They traveled land and sea to discover new places and learn what, and that's all that's about legible. The third message seems to be another newspaper with the headline that reads, Mass Trimming Infestation, with a question mark written with a highlighter. Again, some parts are blacked out, but we can also read that it says, estimated 400 plus trimmings gathered around a large abandoned satellite dish, with satellite dish being highlighted as well. The next message is a storybook page with an illustration of a boat at sea struggling to stay afloat. The text that we can read says, during the travels on one of their, a great storm struck. It was so powerful, it swayed the boat and the royal family that rode it and pushed the prince into the sea. Next, we see a newspaper clipping with the headline that reads, Largest Meat Snake Ever Discovered. During a sweep of an underground settlement made during the war, a massive sized meat snake was discovered stuck inside an underground railway. The beast was measured at a total of 40 meters in length. It is believed that bodies gathered during the war were fed to the creature, causing it to reach the unbelievable size. With the last thing we're able to read highlighted in yellow, cult activity. The next is a storybook page, this one being the most legible one, reading, After being stranded at sea, the young prince eventually was cast into an island. Injured, the prince stumbled his way into a nearby cave. The prince used what magic he could to put himself into a healing sleep. The illustration shows the prince wandering into a cave. This is followed by another storybook page with an illustration depicting a passage of time with different seasons. It reads, The prince's sleep was long. He slept for what seemed like forever. As he slept, the land around him changed and grew. It was unrecognizable from when the prince first arrived, but the sleep still needed time to heal the prince. Much more time, but it kept the prince safe while he rested, guarding him from the elements as the land changed. The next note is another newspaper clipping that says, Family attacked by harvester while hiking. Then highlighted in yellow is, Authorities refuse to handle the harvester. The next is a storybook page that says, Outside the cave, a time of hardship lived the island critters. The critters were struggling in this hard time. There was barely any food to go around. They would go and gather whatever. And unfortunately, I can't make out what the rest of this page says specifically, but I think the information presented paints a pretty clear picture that they were just struggling. The next image that flashes seems to be just pictures, one of them being a dark circle with a red triangle in the middle, and the second looks to be two silhouettes raising their hands with a red sky behind them. This next one is interesting because the image flashes when it's about to talk about the monoliths, which shows this fully red circle right in the position where the singularity would be. So maybe that footage was actually cut out due to it being confidential, I don't know. This is also when we're given our sixth storybook page that says, Although one day, the critters found the cave while searching for food. They found the prince in a trance in his healing sleep. The critters were so awestruck and enchanted by the prince's magic. 
Then the final hidden message that we see in the documentary is page 7 of the storybook with these three little guys on it. What I'm able to make out on this page is that the creators argued amongst themselves. Who is this creature? Why are they here? Are they dangerous? A thought was brought up. What if this creature could use its magic to help them? It may grow food or heal sickness. They continued to argue about the prince and his magic. In the end, the majority of the creatures agreed that the prince was dangerous and should not be meddled with. And that about sums up the content presented in the Living Meat documentary. A mature mimic's diet is comprised entirely of human. <laughs> This video starts through the viewer's perspective of someone flipping through channels trying to find something to watch. Very briefly, we come across this channel saying that someone by the name of Vincent Barrier, Barrier, I th Bar Bar is wanted by the CSIS, which stands for Canadian Security Intelligence Service. The viewer isn't very interested, so they briskly skip all the way to this cooking channel called Cook at Home Kitchen. It introduces a dish simply called Cheesy Crawl Panay. It lists the ingredients that are required for the dish, including roughly three cups of fresh crawl. You get your pasta, your vegetables, your cheese, your spices, and the most important ingredient, your or Co. new flavor enhancer. Yeah, this channel's got a sponsor, baby. No, not... not Completely unrelated, I would never put something in my food just called flavor enhancer, like what is that even supposed to mean? What flavor is it enhancing? Especially something with so many ingredients, what what is it even really doing? Anyways, this person comes out with a fire resistant suit for whatever reason and begins to attempt to cook the dish. You're, you're kind of spilling some of the water there. They start prepping the crawl after setting aside the pot and holy shit, does that look disgusting. It doesn't help that it's making these gross noises with it. They start cutting up the greens on the shit smeared cutting board that definitely should have been cleaned before doing that and then go ahead and set that aside too. Then they begin to cook the crawl on a skillet while boiling the pasta. The crawl turns brown and looks very similar to cooked ground beef. They add in the extra stuff, don't forget the flavor enhancer, and mix it all in and wait. The person is wearing some sort of gas mask here so they weren't just randomly wearing a thick ass jumpsuit. It seems that it's actually some sort of biohazard suit. This is very interesting because in the previous documentary we're told that crawl is very safe and nutritious to eat. But if that's the case then why is this person wearing a biohazard suit? Uh, I'm sure it's nothing. Sprinkle a little cheese on there and bada boom the whole family's eating good baby. We're given a moment to admire this amazing dish while the broadcast is interrupted with the screen. Honestly I can only confidently say that I know what the middle sticky note says. Who are they? This note is posted on a picture of a dark circle with a few other smudges around it. Then we get more glitching and are presented with another storybook page. This one, jumping between frames, I can read that it says, Although the other critters ignored the rest of their fellow kind, instead, they secretly visited the slumbering visitor. They snuck what little food they had and carefully fed it to the prince, greatly hastening their recovery. Then the video ends. This one was more world building as we see how integrated crawl is into society when it's a standard that people will buy it from the market fresh or even have their own garden. Additionally, we get our first character in the series and another storybook page. So yeah, a lot of useful information in this video. Guy Owning a Pet Trimming is an informational video about pet ownership and starts out as such. It gives us an introduction to having a pet. It talks about how most people will just get the boring old cat or dog, but if you want something more interesting, then you should get a... Nah, what the fuck? What? Don't, don't pet it like it's a soft cat. That thing probably smells awful and feels like a plastic bag full of raw meat. It looks like Guts and Koska's infected demon child from Berserk. You mean to tell me that people still want these things in their home? Are you serious right now, bro? Dude, I just don't believe it. Okay, well, the video explains that trimmings need to maintain a warm environment to nest. A setup that works well is a box with some blankets thrown in there and... Oh my... Oh my god. What? No, don't... Don't name it Angelica. What the... What is wrong with you? How do you see this thing and think, Oh, precious baby. Henceforth, you will be known as Angelica. 
Trimmings can live off a diet of dried cat or dog food that is high in protein, and as a treat you can give them food scraps. It casually mentions that trimmings are nocturnal and make this noise at night. A thing to remember is trimmings are nocturnal and make plenty of noise. because nothing beats sounds of the ocean like the screams of the damned. Yep, that puts me right to sleep at night. We're told that if you're gonna own a trimming, that you need to have enough space in your house for the trimming to roam around, and access to a backyard is a plus. Checking them out on walks too is also a good way for them to get exercise, as well as an opportunity for them to meet other trimmings. It tells us to play that trimmings usually like to push or pull smaller objects around and oddly tells us that trimmings like to watch TV and listen to the radio. It also explains to us how to properly bathe trimmings and reminds us that trimmings are social creatures, so giving them lots of affection is good. This could include petting, scratching, and even talking to them to replicate their lifestyle among other trimmings. The video thankfully ends, and we can hear what sounds like someone hastily writing something down before we see static and it flashes to page 9 of the storybook. It reads, One day, the prince awoke suddenly. Thanks to the critter's assistance, the healing process finished very quickly. The prince had fully recovered and now was fully awake and aware of their surroundings. Surprised by the sudden awakening, the critters ducked and hid from the prince's sight. Then the video actually ends. This video starts with a typical warning that shows us this image. It's a scan of a hand-drawn image that says Tunnel Discovery, 1945. There's a drawing of a large meat snake that looks to be about 30 meters long. There's also a black box covering text that is pointing to an object towards the front of the drawing. We then see a photo of the meat snake as the video explains that after the war, nations affected by its impact started cleaning up their cities, and this is when a cleaning crew discovered the meat snake completely plugging the tunnel. Not only was the meat snake extremely large, but it had many other differences from a regular meat snake. For one, it had multiple skulls lining the opening of its mouth. It also had strange colorization. As opposed to the bright red of the typical Vita carnis species, this meat snake was a deep maroon hue. The outer membrane was also a lot more resilient to weather and was more durable by comparison to the typical meat snake. Usually meat snakes can only inhabit warmer climates, but this one's skin was highly resilient to extreme cold, heat, and even radiation. The meat snake was strangely also noted to have a pleasant smell similar to cooking scrambled eggs. The meat snake barely moved at all and was described as acting more as a plant rather than an organism. This creature barely moved. Meat snakes are normally sluggish and encumbersome, but the specimen discovered seemed to lack even basic motor functions. Its behavior was that of a plant's, stationary, with only minor movements within. A separate cleaning crew discovered on the other side of the meat snake was a large pile of bones which explains how the meat snake grew so large. The video then tells us that the meat snake was later reported missing by unknown sources before it glitches and flashes this image of a suited man with a blacked out face. It resumes, then says, How the meat snake grew in size was discovered to be while zooming into this blacked out part of the initial drawing. Meaning whatever this is supposed to be is how the meat snake ended up growing to be such a large size. The video ends then flashes a storybook page that reads, One of the critters built up courage to meet the now awake stranger. They crawled to the prince's side and extended their hand in friendship. The prince reached back and together they had formed the bond that would change their fate. And that's the end of the meat snake specimen footage. The next video released in this series is the Mimic Defense Instructional Tape and was released by the Canadian government. This video starts off exactly how it sounds. It's a sort of remake to the Mimic portion in the Living Meat research documentary and for the first few minutes goes over Mimic behavioral patterns 
and how to properly protect yourselves from them. The date of the recording says that it's October 23rd of 1986 and claims that the number of fatalities and missing persons report has drastically increased due to a growth in mimic population. It tells us again that mimics are highly intelligent and adaptive predators that feed solely on humans. Mimics will stalk their victims, observing their daily routine to discover when they are most vulnerable and then attacking them. This is typically when they're asleep, walking alone, or in a confined area where they would be unable to run away. This is all information that we've known already, but then mentions to us that Mimics will use various tactics to blend into their environment. Tactics include hiding in furniture such as sofas, wardrobes, and putting on clothing such as hoodies, shirts, and pants to blend in with large crowds. It tells us that in some cases, Mimics can grow and develop very human-like features that makes them even harder to tell but then immediately shows us these images. Ah uh, yes, I am very human and would love to walk you home to ensure your safety. If you're watching this and think that this looks like a human, I have bad existential news for you because you are 100% a mimic. These sketches are just very uncanny. Not to mention they have really long fingers that don't have any fingernails and have irregular walking patterns, which is even more of a give. Information on how to fight against mimics is also very different in this video claiming that if you see a mimic, first stand your ground and try to appear larger. Flail your arms around and make as much noise as possible. You see, they're very intelligent, but now can also be fought off similar to how you can fend off a bear. Additionally, if you're armed, aim for the head or legs because this can temporarily stun them, which is different because initially we're told that these things basically are invincible and you can only use weapons to block the mimic's attacks to stall time. If you have a weapon, do not use it. A mimic is fairly resilient, and any strikes or shots on a mimic is not effective enough to bring it down in time. Instead, use it as a barrier between you and the mimic to block any attacks. Then this section of the video ends and we hear new tape being put into a tape player VCR thing. This video says that it's an evidence tape that features two individuals named Christopher and Janice and comes from the year 1983, three years before the Mimic Defense tape was broadcasted. There seems to be a checklist for whoever initially had this tape that says to observe the footage for confidential information then discard and destroy all copies of it. The tape begins with the two characters walking in the dark to a location that we actually never end up seeing. Christopher mentions that there's only 30 minutes worth of footage available on the camera, but then for some reason records their walk all the way there. He tells us that they're going to a guy's house who was brutally slain by something unknown to the public, though we obviously know it's a mimic. Apparently the police in the area completely blocked off the area and moved neighboring residents to a different location. They've also been very secretive about the details of the tragedy, claiming that he not alived himself. Christopher says that the reason they're going there is to film a sort of documentary on the scene in hopes of selling it to some journalist or a news company. Honestly, this whole part of the video kind of just drags on a little too long. A lot of the content of the tape is just them discussing random stuff while walking. Are you sure we should be out this late? Fine. I'll cook you stuff when we get home. Don't worry. I'm hungry. Dogs barking are never a good sign. Like, it's literally up there. Okay. Come on. It's not too late yet. I'm hungry. You said that already. Yeah. I'm still hungry. None of the information is very important other than the information we learned about the man until they finally get to this location. He reads from a note card and here the audio gets muffled with the word confidential over it, but you can still pretty clearly hear what he's saying. They try to do another take and Janice forgets to press record, making Christopher frustrated, so they just leave. As they're leaving, he kind of just disappears and leaves Janice alone. Yeah, like, back there was the perfect time for a serial killer to just jump out and grab us, you know? Cut it out! It's scary enough as is. Chris? Babe? Chris? 
She walks around for a bit until she comes across a mimic hiding behind a car. And oh man, the suit does not look too great here. Anyways, she runs from the mimic, but it's a lot faster than her. So it catches up to her pretty easily after she tries to take shelter in this house she comes across. The mimic breaks in, attacking Janice, and the video ends as we hear it eject. Then right before the video actually ends, another storybook page flashes. This one reads, The creators led the prince out of the cave, up to the top of the hill the prince had laid buried under, and showed him the forest. This is our home, full of wonder and beauty, although the forest struggles to provide for us critters and we are facing disaster. Can you help us? This video opens up giving us documentation of an abnormality within the harvester population, saying that there was a shift in population density between August 1st and October 1st of 1989. This information is confirmed by a map that shows the harvester population plotted onto a map of Canada. On August 1st, we can see that they heavily populated either the far east or the far west of Canada. The map glitches out and shows us a strange picture of a family followed by a blurried picture of a larger and a smaller figure with brightly colored jackets hiking through a forest. We then see this, followed by another picture of the two figures, this time with some distance in between them, with the one in the blue jacket seemingly looking back to the other person. Glitches back to the map before flashing a map of September 1st. Pausing on this frame, we can see that the western population of harvesters has shifted towards the center of Canada. We see this again as it's doing that dang before the video cuts to black and we hear what I think sounds like walking until we hear a bump and a child starts crying. The video turns back on and we see blood begin to pool over some kind of light while we can still hear the crying in the back. It then cuts to what I assume is a human head underneath the ground as the flesh on the head melts off and leaves a skull behind. We then see the photo again only slightly more creepy than it was before with one of the children appearing decayed. We then see the map of the harvester population on October 1st and see that most of them have shifted near the coast of the Hudson Bay. We see another image while the crying picks back up seemingly of the person in the orange coat as they're laying down in a pool of blood. Then it shows a head, this time it being more visible, screaming in a dark area as their flesh begins to melt off again. This image appears again, this time with the mother decayed as well. The shot lingers until it cuts out briefly and we see the 12th storybook page that reads, The prince stood back, spread his arms, and before him glowed a bright light, mystical shapes and colors, lights and figures. The critters watched with wide eyes. Such sublime brilliance. The prince completed his display and vowed with the power that he held and the help of his kingdom that he shall heal their home. All right, gotta take a drink of water. Got a little sick. This video begins by explaining to us that the way fast food tastes is what makes people enjoy eating so much and asks the question, what if it tasted better? Nutrier Co. was mentioned earlier in the series in the cook-along video when it was added into the dish. It says that with the overwhelming popularity of the flavor enhancer, they are now going to introduce a new flavor enhancer deluxe. With the deluxe, you get a larger amount and a modified recipe that it just chooses not to elaborate on. The flavor enhancer was released in mid-1990 and was apparently an instant hit, skyrocketing in sales. Though we can only assume that because this graph has no labels on it and given that it's coming from this sketchy ass company, not too sure how reliable it is. Like, what? why is there a squiggly here? What, what is that? Ah yeah, dump that on there. Now doesn't that look dry as hell? Oh, none for the vegetables? <laughs> All right. Kind of strange that there's a specific temperature for an optimal flavor of 60 degrees Celsius, 140 degrees Fahrenheit for my fellow Americans. The video, uh, I'm not really sure what to call this. It does this and then cuts to another commercial, basically saying the same thing as the previous one. New Trier Co. Experience true savor.
This happens one more time though, this time when the static appears on the TV there's a sort of sped up screaming, and when the video resumes it's quickly overwhelmed with static and that strange sound again. The next one we see has the absolute worst meal I have ever seen. Well your kids with this essential part of every meal. New trier. Yeah, I would start screaming like that too if I was given a plate of this man. Then the video gets weird. There's a single piece of bread on the damn plate and they just started dumping that on there. The voice this time is robotic as when the other ones were human sounding voice recordings. He tells us to put a little more on and when he does, we can faintly hear another voice echoing this in a whispering tone. Flavor and answer deluxe. Required for all meals, no matter how small it seems, just a little more. It is crucial to everyday eating. King Crimson shenanigans ensue before we get some less than subtle subliminal messaging. And the video ends, giving us the 12th storybook page. This one reads, the prince gathered what he could and then set sail onward. Once the prince returned home, they will come back to the island and return to the critters. So after seeing all the information presented so far, I've come up with what I think is a strong working theory of what's going on. But again, this is my first time doing a serious analysis slash theory video, so just bear with me. The subject matter of the video helps to build the world and gives us an insight to what's currently happening on the Earth this is all taking place on. We start with the introduction to the primary threats within the series, which are the meat monsters. The documentary starts at seemingly the least dangerous and scales up to the most dangerous types of meat creatures. We're told when and shown where they reside and also are given information on how they function. The following videos released focus individually on each type of creature previously described in the documentary and are released in the same order they were presented in the documentary. The Cheese Crawl Panay video comes first and is a seemingly innocent, albeit pretty disgusting, cook along featuring the crawl. We see the first cracks in the facade when you discover the individual cooking the dish is wearing some type of hazmat suit. We soon learn why this is as they include a special flavor enhancer which, jumping ahead a bit, is a seasoning created by a cult that contains host spores. I know. I know. I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get around to it. This is supported by the fact that the release order matches up with when the host of influence was introduced in the documentary. Initially, I thought perhaps that it was the crawl that was actually dangerous, but no, the flavor enhancer is. Guide to owning a pet trimming is the next and seemingly another innocent video on the surface. I know how I had initially reacted to the trimming video, but honestly, after staring at this for hours on end while editing this video, it's kind of grown on me. So I guess I'm the exact type of oblivious viewer this video is directed towards, huh? Among the silly nature of the video, it has its cracks as well that hint towards a more insidious story. It tells us that trimmings love to listen to the radio or watch TV. Normally, this would just seem like some kind of quirky thing that they do, but in the documentary, we see newspaper articles that reveal crawl and trimmings have been attracted to radio towers. Now, I don't think they actually listen to the radio or watch TV. I know that's, that's a pretty controversial take right there, but instead can sort of detect the electromagnetic waves that these devices are giving off. The way it just stands there makes it seem like it's waiting for some type of signal. The other strange thing in this video is that when we hear the, what the trimming sounds like, Aside from it inherently sounding very eerie, this just doesn't sound like an animal sound. It sounds like it's in distress and calling out to something. The Mimic Defense instructional tape is almost like a re-release of the Mimic section in the Meat documentary. It gives us differing information on Mimic behavior and how to fight against them. After this is presented, the tape switches to a case report of two individuals being attacked by Mimic, Christopher and Janice. They make their way to a location where police have stated a man took his life, but some are skeptical of this conclusion of the case as law enforcement is keeping specifics very minimal. You're 19. Teenage boy was coming home from the trailer late night. Although, when he arrived at home, he found a grizzly scene. Detail Barrar, his father that he came home to, was found dead. Strange thing though, they immediately closed off everything. 
Eventually, they encounter a mimic and soon meet their end before the videotape abruptly ends. The anomaly report is a tape constructed to directly compare the population density of harvesters and is intercut with images and pictures of the family that was reportedly attacked by a harvester. We're shown what happens to people when they're abruptly attacked and pulled under the surface by a harvester. The Flavor Enhancer commercial is what I assume are snippets of different commercials of the Flavor Enhancer put together to showcase the strange nature of the product. The cult behind this product in the Panay cook-along seek to further get people to eat the Flavor Enhancer. And once they got them hooked, this commercial in particular aims to control and manipulate people to consume the product in higher volumes. All these tapes are more than just tapes as we view them. The series is presented to us through the first person point of view of someone watching these tapes that they have collected. This is evident throughout the series as we visually see and hear between some of the videos the individual would put in a different tape as well as hear them inject at the end of the video. Additionally, we can hear at the end of some of the videos that the person viewing the tapes is taking notes. Who this person is isn't explicitly mentioned at any point during the series, but I believe that this person is Vincent Barrere. Vincent is the only named character besides Christopher and Janice, and it's done in a very particular way. Intercut as the viewer is flipping through channels when the wanted poster is shown during the cook along video. The way that the viewer stops on this channel then briskly flips to another channel is my first indication that this is through Vincent's perspective. Normally if someone were to see a wanted man alert they'd want to watch it through to get more information on them, you know to see if they're dangerous or if they're close to your location, but this viewer just skips to the next channel, almost as if they already know about the wanted man because they are that wanted man. Not only that, but Vincent's father was confirmed to be the man killed in the footage featuring Christopher and Janice, as Christopher says the last name Barrere when he's explaining information of the attack. Detail Barrere, his father that he came home to, was found dead. The grisly scene lies before him. Police were called, they came to investigate. This would draw a connection between Christopher and Janice's death to Vincent's dad's death, just why out of the many casualties, this is the one that he discovered and looked into. This also kind of soft confirms that Vincent's family was the one that got attacked by the harvester because it says that the son came home and discovered his father dead with no mention of any other family members, meaning that it was just the two of them living together. This would give Vincent a strong motive to begin looking into the carnist species when authorities did nothing to help. After a harvester had taken his mother and brother away and yet again when law enforcement tried to cover up the obvious homicide scene, claiming that his father had taken his own life. Continuing with this facade that the threat Vita Carnus posed is almost non-existent. While researching harvesters, he discovered a strange population shift towards the center of Canada. He creates a log to document this and while he's making it, he begins to have visions or flashbacks to when his brother and brother were killed. I believe that these are visions Vincent is having because it's just not logical that this footage was recorded underneath the surface and perfectly captured the demise of his mother and brother. Additionally, as we hear screaming, it's not synced up to who's shown on screen, which leads me to think that Vincent heard the screaming and what we are seeing are bits of the nightmares that it has given him as he can only imagine the pain and suffering that his brother endured before passing away. Just further evidence pointing toward Vincent being the surviving son of the harvester attack. Wait, what? There, there was a new video posted a few days ago. Ah, uh, well. That means this one's about the monolith. Wait, let's check that out. That was not about the monolith. Okay, well, full transparency, I had already watched this video before starting to write this analysis. You were just making it look like you didn't watch the video. You're a phony! Hey! This guy's a great big phony! He's the old draft of my analysis. Thanks, Darian. And I didn't really know how to properly implement it within the video. This is because this entry is not at all like any other in the series. The content of this video is someone directly speaking to the viewer and basically just features a lot of the photos and newspaper clippings that were hidden throughout the series. 
I believe that the person speaking is Vincent, and he has sent the information to another individual who shares similar interests about discovering the truth behind what's going on, most likely because he's being closed in on by the government. The first thing that we're told is the person who's received the tapes is a member of a private organization called CARCAS, a clever acronym for Containment and Research Consult Association Society. Arcus has received backlash from the government and is now currently under heat by certain government agencies for violation of newly introduced policies. It pans over some pictures we've seen before as well as photos of Christopher and Janice and then shows this article about the National Living Meat Research Organization, which says that the teenagers behind the footage were arrested for its release. It says that it had some sensitive material and defamation, which is referring to the images that would briefly flash throughout. Then it says that some of the suspects have been arrested while other outside sources are still at large, this part most likely referring to Vincent himself. We are then shown this image again along with two new photos of government officials as it says that they have kept us in the dark, referring to all the cover-up and silencing the government has been doing. Next is information on the flavor enhancer, and we see an x-ray labeled frontal lobe deterioration, as he tells us that they have been numbing our minds to their schemes. This statement can be taken metaphorically and literally if the flavor enhancer has some sort of properties that are able to physically make people ill and even deteriorate parts of the frontal lobe, which has important motor functions such as storing memory and voluntary movement. This also makes sense given that the spores of the host, when inhaled, will make the infected walk towards their location. It pans to these images next, and I'm honestly not too sure what to make of these. Either I missed these images in the series, or we're missing some context to them. He tells us that he believes that something big is going to happen soon, but he doesn't have the power to change anything, which is why he sent the viewer all this information. Included was a location and plans of a meeting. He wants the viewer to go there and somehow end whatever it is that's going on. It cuts back to the footage that was initially being shown before it cuts out and we hear a loud tearing and are shown what's left of a page. This is most likely the final storybook page that shows what happens once the prince returns to the island with the rest of the royal family. In terms of a chronological order of events that happens, the beginning of the story of Vita Carnis starts with the first storybook page. We're given an introduction to a royal family that has magical powers and comes from a distant kingdom. The royal family presented in the story are most likely a sort of higher cosmic power or entity that travels through space to seek more knowledge. During the family's space travels, the family gets caught up in a storm and the prince is thrown overboard and is lost at sea. The storm mentioned is most likely a type of cosmic event, such as a supernova or a black hole that they encountered which resulted in the prince being thrown off course with the rest of his own kind. The prince eventually ends up washing ashore onto an island and wanders into a cave. Then he covers himself in a protective magic and goes into a healing sleep and begins to recover his strength. This is when the entity or prince drifts through space heavily weakened and eventually crash lands on earth. Next few story pages are pretty much beat for beat what actually happens. The entity is in a healing slumber for a very long time and eventually is discovered by the critters. Now, what the critters are is one of the biggest mysteries of this series and I genuinely believe that what you think their identity is completely changes the perspective of how you see the story. That being said, I think that the critters are indeed human, modern day and humans to be exact. So when humans discover this cosmic entity, most of them agree that it's very dangerous and should not be messed with. Naturally though, there were a small group of individuals who were fascinated by this strange creature. They saw the potential benefit that this creature could bring to them if they were to help it. They could somehow tell that it was weakened and fed it whatever they could find which greatly accelerated the healing process and soon enough in 1931 the entity awoke. Obviously startled by the sudden awakening and the general fear of the creature's unknown nature, the people ran and hid from its sight and observed it from a distance until someone finally went up up to it and made their presence known. This is when humans and the entity, or the prince, first made contact and these particular people created a bond with this entity. After the first contact was made, the people there let it out of where it was resting and showed it the land around them. They further explained to the entity that our world is a very beautiful one, but they were in a time of hardship and were struggling the way things are. The prince then put on a display of magic. Power drawn from the energy around him was used to create the Vita Carnish species. The display of power wasn't just to impress the critters, this was the first step of his plan to help them. The Carnish species was definitely created all at once, basically overnight as evident to their explosive jump in population, which is why I think that they were created by the prince, instead of already existing on the planet. And this moment when the prince uses his magic for the first time, fits in place of when he would have actually done it. 
Following the creation of the Vita Carnis, the prince sailed off the island to return back to his kingdom, to return with his family and further help the critters with their problem. If the royal family are cosmic entities and the earth is represented by the island the prince was washed up on, we can assume that he has since left earth while the critters stay and wait for his return. As I was looking around, I noticed that a popular idea is that the singularity is the prince. I think this is certainly a possibility, but given that page 12 of the storybook shows us that the prince has left the island, I don't think that's the case. I believe that the singularity is some sort of portal or intergalactic travel device the prince used to return back to his home. This is the most likely way that he would have left the planet without a large number of people around the area noticing, whether intentional or not, by the prince. It just makes the most sense, given its existence is only ever acknowledged by this small section. After its departure, the people that aided the entity's recovery stood together and formed a following that worshipped it. Because to them, these promises it made of helping resulted in them viewing it as a savior. These people saw firsthand its power, and with their bond they formed pledged allegiance to it. The storybook pages as we see them are most likely created by the cult to show new members to explain the origins of their organization, and to further paint the entity in a more positive and easy to process way. Although they awaited the return of the prince, the cult would not idly wait, and would begin to attempt and succeed to increase their influence among the general population. At some point after their creation, crawl and trimmings would be discovered infesting radio towers and satellite dishes respectively. This coupled with the common knowledge of trimmings enjoying listening to radio and watching TV, it seems as though they're waiting for communication from the singularity. Given that magnetic fields and energy signals are given off of the singularity, which is vaguely what these devices work off of, in 1945 after the war had ended, a large meat snake measuring approximately 30 meters would be discovered in an underground tunnel and had strange variations of a regular meat snake, including a slightly pleasant smell and a tough exterior membrane. This meat snake would disappear without a trace overnight. Then again, in 1947, a large meat snake was found in an underground settlement where it is assumed that bodies left around battlefields were fed to it in secret which made it the large size. This one too would disappear mysteriously. In 1972, the seven monoliths would appear on the island. Somewhere between the years 1976 and 1978, assuming that Vincent is in the 8 to 10 range based on this photo, the Barrere family would be attacked by a harvester, ending the lives of the mother and the youngest brother. In 1980, Vincent's father would be stalked and followed home by a mimic that would end up taking his life. Vincent would go home and discover his father and call the police who would rule it as a sp Vincent knowing his father and seeing the crime scene would know this was not true and eventually take matters into his own hands to figure out the truth behind the Vita Carnis and why the government refuses to take action against them. Three years later in 1983, Christopher and Janice would attempt to film a documentary covering the case of Vincent's father and would meet their fate by a mimic as well. Sometime between 1983 and 1986, Vincent along with some classmates would release the Living Meat research documentary, and unknown to the rest of the group, Vincent would include information he discovered while researching the Vita Carnis species, with the intent that people watching would notice and catch on to its strange activity of the Carnis and the government's refusal to take action against them. Not too long after, the other students would be arrested for the extra material within the documentary, while Vincent would somehow invade law enforcement, and in 1986 the Canadian government would feel forced to release their own video on how to protect yourself due to the information presented in the documentary and the overwhelming increase in the mimic population. This video would include almost the same information but would give different methods on how to defend yourself from mimics. The only reason why I could think that this would be is because they would want people to try and fight back against the mimics instead of properly defend themselves and avoid mimics altogether. If this is why, then it seems like the producers of this video's intent was to have individuals who encounter mimics actually fall victim to them so that they could further cover up the attacks. But again, I'm not certain on why the information presented is different. This part gets a little messy simply due to the lack of information, so I'm going to have to fill in some blanks. In 1988, Vincent's desire for information on the Vita Carnis led him to attempt to get onto the island where the monoliths reside and ended up getting discovered through some type of security cameras or surveillance. Vincent was later linked back to the production of the Living Meat documentary and that was added to his charges. Vincent would lay low for a while and in 1989 discover a population shift within harvesters and notice that they are shifting towards central Canada, more specifically this island in the Hudson Bay. In 1990, Nutrier Co. would be founded and would sell their signature flavor enhancer product. Over the next six months, the product would become an instant hit. This leads us to where we are now. 
Vincent is being closed in on by the authorities and understands that he doesn't have much time left as a free man, so he sends all of his findings to an individual that shares similar interest in discovering the truth. He explains to the carcass member that he can't be the one to put a stop to whatever it is that's unfolding because of the heat he's under, so they need to be the one to go to the location to discover their truth and or stop it. And that's where we're at now. Hello everyone. If you made it this far, I just want to thank you. First and foremost, huge shout out to the creator of this series, Darren Kuloi. This man is just so talented, it's it's unreal. The hand-drawn artwork, effects, props, and the videos themselves are all so fantastic, and he really just flexes how talented of an artist he is. My first video blew up to a degree that I thought I would only see in my dreams, so I also wanted to give a huge thank you to everyone who commented on that video and subscribed. I read all the comments of that video and so many of you left behind such nice and positive comments, and some even gave me advice on how to improve my videos, and I just really appreciate all that. I hope if you liked this video you consider sticking around because I plan on doing more just like it, probably a few smaller uploads in between these really long ones, because th these these take a lot of energy. I, I totally totally underestimated how much work goes into these long videos a lot of work has gone into making sure that it was better than my last one so i hope that shows but that's about it thanks again and i'll see you all in the next video peace